country. Um, to everyone who is joining us from, from near and far, um, welcome. Um, along with my colleague, Karen, uh, who's doing all the behind the scenes work now, but will be a little more part of the uh, upfront scenes by the end of the night. Um, on behalf of everyone else too at um, Seattle's Elliott Bay Book Company, which is located on Duwamish land in the Capitol Hill neighborhood. We are delighted you're joining us for this evening's program, which features um, novelist, mystery novelist, Naomi Hirahara, um, uh, with her wonderful, captivating new, and, and also very informative new um, novel, Clark and Division. And um, to be joined in conversation but with Frank Abe here in Seattle, I'll say a little bit more about Frank too uh, in just a moment. Actually, Naomi, I'm saying she's a novelist, but she's also uh, a, a nonfiction writer of note. And in fact, I think both she and Frank um, have brought have bring a background of of journalism and and kind of um, excellent narrative writing to what they've been doing um, along the way. Naomi, um, as many of you know, is the author of a, a fabulous series of, of mystery novels featuring uh, a character Mas Arai, who um, in such books as Gasa Gasa Girl and Hiroshima Boy, um, and um, I think about five others. Um, this book, uh, Clark and Division, um, that is a that is an address or a location in Chicago. It's a book that um, takes up at a certain significant time, um, 1944, World War II still being fought, and um, a family that um, has been released from the Manzanar camp and incarcerated there um, in California has come to Chicago, um, join, joining a family member who has already gone there, and then things happen. And um, I'm because these kind of books are um, a little tricky to talk about, and uh, Naomi and Frank will be very skilled in it because there's, um, as, a, as a work of fiction, there's also certain disclosures and there's um, things you don't want to give away, um, but, but, but that's part of reading a book that has that kind of um, page turning, um, you know, captivating tale aspect to it, but also in a case of a book such as this really has um, important information. Uh, and and um, though fiction, we learn much by what is considered fiction um, th that really happens. Sometimes what really happens sounds beyond fiction. So fiction here um, describing a lot of what was happening to Japanese Americans, what was happening in Chicago, and um, not only to them, but within the community um, as this book really um, dramatically unfolds. Um, Frank Abe joining us, he was here in Seattle, um, himself has been a longtime treasure. Uh, we have certainly known, we meaning Seattle people have certainly known him for years as a, as a news journalist, um, playing a great role in not only in, in covering regular news, but all along um, helping highlight and celebrate and um, draw attention to the work of Asian American writers in Seattle and elsewhere. Um, for us at LA Bay, he was often um, helping get people to know about some of the writers. We've had some of the writers, um, many writers later well-known come to LA Bay well before they were ever known. And he, he was, um, along with people like David Ishii, were um, people that really helped um, uh, stimulate that. Now that he's retired as a journalist, however, he's really started working um, and has been um, quite active in on various fronts. He most recently has been doing a program such as this for his own co-authored book, uh, the graphic novel, We Hereby Refuse, um, a, a tremendous book that um, uh, may, we may get said a little more about how hard it has been to get it back from being reprinted, but um, there's a great demand um, for that book and, and what and the story it tells. He earlier um, in, in the book realm, um, was the author of the American Book Award winning John Okada, The Life and Rediscovered Work of the Author of Nono Boy. And we'll be hearing more about John Okada in time to come, along with other things that Frank is doing. He also um, made the award winning PBS documentary, um, uh, Con Conscience and the Constitution um, on uh, Organized Resistance um, to uh, Internment. Um, so the two of them will, um, Naomi and Frank, will um, talk tonight. Naomi will read a little bit from this book. Um, you'll be, we'll all be back in, in another time. But I think um, books such as what Naomi's done and, and the work Frank's done, um, those set addressing times that are now uh, nearing 70 years ago um, are also very timely now for things 
um, that people have done and look to do in this country um, to different communities and populations within the country. Um, they will, Frank will be asking Naomi questions, but please um, do join into the conversation by putting your questions in the chat or the Q and A. Frank will um, work those in um, as at later later in the hour, and I believe my co colleague Karen will come in and, and do the appropriate things at the end. I will um, therefore now disappear from the scene of this, but to say it's a great pleasure to have you all here again, and now to ask you please join in um, welcoming with pleasure um, the wonderful Naomi Hirahara and Frank Abe for this program. Thank you both. Thank you very much, Rick. It's good to see you again, by the way. And, and hello, Naomi. How are you? I'm good. Good to see you, Frank. Speaking to us from your home in Pasadena. Yes. Okay. Pasadena, California. <laughs> yeah, well. not, not to be mistaken for Texas. <laughs> oh, that's right. Well, congratulations on the success of Clark and Division. Great advance praise. And like you tweeted, uh, your first review in the New York Times, for example. I really want to know, you, you've done, I mean, you're, you're an established mystery novelist, seven books with Masarai, two with Ellie Rush, and so on, nonfiction books, Life After Manzanar. How are you taking all this new attention in mm. for Clark and Division? You know, it's weird. I almost feel like I'm a debut author in some It does way. feel that way. It's, it's, it's interesting. Well, I think, um, you know, I'm a paperback original author, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I kind of like that my books, when they first come out, they're affordable, right? The, like some of the books, you, they can actually fit in someone's pocket. And um, I, I, I like that mass market kind of aspect to it. Um, but I have to say, there's something about the, a hardcover. And Soho uh, Crime, my publisher, did just such a beautiful job in packaging it from the cover to, you know, we work together on the blurbs. And I never really, you know, to tell you quite honestly, Frank, you know, I'm not eager to go out and ask my colleagues or people I don't know that well for blurbs, right? It's so in the past, no one's really pressured me or not, I shouldn't say pressured, but the publishers didn't make that a huge priority, but with this book we did. Yeah. And, um, and I, I guess it is helpful. But what, what I also love is there's a map inside. So I just like it as, a, you know, the book as an object is really nice. It because, feels good in the hand. Yes, mm -hmm, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and the map is so so helpful. You can locate all the different uh, uh, plot points in, 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 the, in, the, in the novel and, and the nice embossed cover. So it's just, as, an, as a book, it feels good in the hand. Mm -hmm. I like that. Uh, well, you know, we, we've known each other since the 1980s when you were editor of the Rafu Shimpo newspaper in Los Angeles, and I was sending you stories from Seattle uh, about redress and JCL wartime cooperation. Do you, do you ever stop and think, Naomi, uh, how far you've come from then till now to where you're at now? Well, again, like my publisher for this book, they had a line in there, Naomi Hirahara uses her 35 years of experience, you know, and, and, and filters it into this book. And I'm going 35 years. I mean, that sounds like such a Scary, long, isn't it? yeah. And then I calculate, I mean, because I do feel, you know, I started working at the Rafu Shimpo, which is a, uh, it literally means Los Angeles newspaper. And it's a Japanese American daily that still exists. It started in 1903. I started working there in um, 1984 as a reporter. Wow. And after I had spent a year in Japan and then come. And then I, I wasn't on the fast track to be a journalist. You know, I think yeah, there's some young people going to college and they intern at the big papers. But I, I kind of fell into that passion uh, when I was in Japan. So, oh. you know, that's why I reached out to, you know, this smaller community press and I was eventually able to get a job with them, which turned out to be the best professional decision of my life because it just made me, um, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in Pasadena and I grew up in Pasadena. So, but suddenly my world in Los Angeles totally opened up because there's the Japanese American community in, you know, South Central and East LA, you know, and all these different pockets and South Bay. And suddenly I was like in my little Toyota Tercel or Honda 
whatever, driving to all these mm. places. And it gave me, you know, such a great education in our community's history. Yeah, you were so knowledgeable at the time. I mean, uh, I, I just re was reading that you were taking creative writing courses at some point in, in, this, in this period. And I, I, I've always wondered, um, I never asked you, are, are you a journalist who became a novelist? Or were you always in your heart a novelist who kind of fell into a job at the Rafu that lasted a decade? Um, a little of both. Um, there, there's a Japanese academician who has written about my work and she said that I had a journalistic flair in my writing. And I first took a, as it a, I was, I didn't know if I should be insulted or not. Right. <laughs> I was right. like, right. you mean I'm not this deep, like literary writer, but now I, I totally embrace it. And actually it's been talk, I, in conversations with other mystery writers who are former journalists, I, I kind of see that, that we have this curiosity. Um, it's not like, I mean, I love uh, poetry and all that, but I think the way I'm wired is looking around outside of myself and try to understand the outside world, try to understand people who are very different from me. I think that's what gets me excited. So I, and I think that's journalism, right? And also working at the paper, you, you know, I did uh, cover crime. So you, you get a sense of how the criminal justice system, you know, work what, for right, better or right. worse, we, yeah. how it works, how, how we, we're doing things. And also people are approaching us, right? They want us to cover a story in a certain way. So that makes us question their motivations. Right. So we're suspicious. Like, why? Why do they, you know, and I think those are all nuggets that are good for mystery writing. Well, you, you've, you've had tremendous success as a mystery novelist, Edgar Award winning uh, Naomi Hirohara. I, I just finished the book last night uh, and I can verify that the mystery really does pay off at the end. I mean, all the all the all the wheels you put in motion in the first half keep grinding away until you know, everything kind of snaps into place at the end. So, so good right. job. And, and it also works on the level of a good old, uh, well, a good old fashioned crime novel mystery, but also on the level of, of historical novel. I think this is where a lot of people are interested in the fact that you've, you've dove, dove into this period of Japanese American history that really no one's really addressed before. Um, what, you know, what, what, uh, and also I, I realized that I've always felt like your, your folks were in camp, like mine, but your folks were, were Hibakusha, in Hiroshima. And so you really had to, re I mean, really kind of get inside the skin of uh, a Nisei woman who was in camp in Manzanar. I, I'm, you know, if someone sees me, they may think, oh, she's an insider, but I'm actually an outsider to this experience. I'm an insider in that I'm Japanese American. And, you know, if I were, was alive at that time, I would have been placed in camp. I'm an insider in that I worked at the paper and spent all those years, you know, covering people. But in terms of my personal, like my, my family, my immediate family, I have extended family members who were in camp, but you know, my dad's cousins and uncles, because he's uh, what they call a Kibe Nisei. He was born in Watsonville, California, but sent to Hiroshima. But since he was uh, when he was a child, but since he had a big extended family in California, they had that wartime experience. But my mother is from Japan, so she's a Japanese immigrant. And that's very different from uh, Nisei, you know, so my, I was oh, yeah. not raised by a Nisei woman. So I've been in, on this quest, Frank, to, to capture the Nisei woman's voice. It's very elusive <laughs> to me. And I, you know, because I think that, and, and I have had some close relationships with Nisei women over the years, of course. but, but um, it's not like a daughter mother thing. So, you know, but just to kind of, un, you know, some women that I've come across, um, they, they're so, um, what's the right, I, I think they're protective of their privacy. So, and then their inner what's going on inside. So I've always been wanting to kind of break through that sheen and especially of a person who's like your quote, quote, typical Nisei. 
um, there's always been these firebrand, you know, Nisei women who, you know, are the leaders of our community. Right. But I think that's different than, you know. The uh, typical. Yes. Yeah. But, but this is where I'm a Nisei, you know, generationally yeah. raised by. So on that sense, I could kind of understand the Nisei point of view in, in the sense that being raised by an immigrant mother, you know, I, I have felt protective of her. And um, I could see how um, Nisei daughters, you know, are protective of their own mothers, just like negotiating the world for them. Uh, we interpret the world for our mothers. So those kind of things, I, I try to, you know, um, infuse in this in the character. So the character of Aki Ito is as a Nisei woman of about what twenty? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, to give us a, a taste or flavor of that character, I'm going to ask you to, uh, you know, if we we're at Elliott Bay, I wish we were in the basement of Elliott Bay doing mm -hmm. an author reading. It was so great. Yep. So uh, I'll ask you to read a bit from Clark and Division. Uh, and, and can you set this up for us? I mean, the, the Itos have been in Manzanar. Uh, uh, Al Rose, her older sister, is released early to go to Chicago. And then uh, the family is following. And uh, well, you take it take from, from there. So something tragic has happened, and you'll find out from the scene. But so now um, this is actually the day, uh, the evening that, or let's see, no, I, I take that back. This is the day after uh, Aki has um, arrived in Chicago. Right. And so she goes to where her um, older sister Rose had been staying. She had been rooming with two other Nisei women and she wants to know what happened to Rose. So, and um, this is, and they're in Clark and Division. I went up the carpeted stairs to the second floor. A cockroach sk skittered by, and I remembered Rose writing that the city was infested with bed bugs. I suppressed the urge to scratch my ankles. Insects were the least of my worries. On the left side of the stairs was number four, my sister's residence. I almost dissolved into tears, but I took two big breaths. Ochitsuki nasai, I ordered myself. I needed to hold it together for Rose's sake. Two firm raps with my knuckles, the rattling turn of a lock, and the door opened to reveal a thin Nisei woman with brownish hair curled up around the nape of her neck. Although it was dark in the hallway, there was a soft light from some lamps inside. The woman, who looked a little older than me, wore a fitted tan dress and raspberry red lipstick. She seemed to know what looked attractive on her skinny frame. I'm Rose's sister, I said. The woman's face fell. Her eyes and red lips sloped down and she seemed frozen for a moment. I'm so sorry, she finally said. Come in, come in. The room held three twin beds, two of them on opposite sides and another that almost blocked the door. Dresses on hangers were suspended from nails high on the wall. The wallpaper beside one of the beds had peeled off, revealing a long crack stained brown by a possible water leak. There was a small refrigerator and hot plate in a corner, but no sink. Aki, right? I've seen a photo of you. Rose spoke about you all the time. I'm Louise. The door opened again and another woman entered, a towel around her neck. She had big eyes and heavy eyebrows that seemed drawn on, but were probably all natural. She looked like one of those healthy farm girl types that could outwork most men. Hello, she said enthusiastically upon laying eyes on me. This is Rose's sister, Louise said in a hushed voice, tone. Aki, oh, I'm Chio, she extended her hand. It felt pillowy and soft until she squeezed. I frowned for a moment. Chio didn't seem like she was from San Francisco and I didn't yet recognize her name. I think there was another roommate. Oh, you must be talking about Tommy, Louise said. She moved out a few months ago. She's a house girl in Evanston now. Couldn't deal with the big city. I took Tommy's spot. I was living in a hallway before, so this sure is a thousand times better. Chio folded her towel on a hanger and placed it on one of the nails on the wall. 
When she turned back around, her cheeks were a little flushed. I didn't know your sister that long. We didn't talk much, but I sure am sorry. Was this the way it was going to be from now on? People looking pitifully at me and my parents? I dipped my head in response. Louise was bringing me Rose's tan suitcase. She had packed all of her things in here. Her toothbrush and cup are still in the hall bathroom, Chio added. I'll go get them. My head was spinning, and Louise must have noticed that I was feeling unwell. Here, sit down. She gestured to the bed that stood awkwardly in the middle of the room, and I sunk into the mattress. The box spring squeezed from my weight. Is this where my sister slept? I felt Louise's eyes all over me as I tried to catch my breath. Her attention made me feel more agitated than grateful. Gio returned with a red toothbrush and a jar that looked like it once held strawberry jam. Why would I want that? I didn't know but I accepted the items gratefully. What a terrible accident, Louise said. Is that what people are saying? Louise and Chio exchanged glances. Well, of course, what else could it be? The coroner thinks that Rose committed suicide. What? Louise seemed genuinely disturbed. Chio, on the other hand, didn't. Rose wouldn't have done that. She wouldn't have abandoned me. Can you tell me how she was that day? She hadn't been feeling well lately, Chio said. Yes, she's been spending a lot of time in bed, Louise added. I figured that she had caught the flu. My sister who was strong as a horse. She hadn't even gotten sick from inoculations in camp, which had sent others to the latrine every hour. Did she go to the doctor? No, she refused. There was regret in Louise's voice as if she should have forced the issues. Some of the hospitals won't accept us Japanese, but there's plenty who would treat us too, said Chio. I needed to understand what had been happening with Rose. Can you tell me who she was spending time with? Well, Roy, of course. That's why we called him when the police came by, Ro Louise explained. Anyone else? Was she seen as someone? Not that I know of, Louise said. There was really no one else. I mean, all of us would go to dances and things in a group. And you know, Rose, always surrounded by the fellows. Chio didn't confirm Louise's observation. I don't go to dances that much. And she and Tommy spent a lot of time together before Tommy moved out to Evanston. Can I get Tommy's phone number? Of course. I have to tell you, though, the lady who she is working for doesn't like her to get many phone calls. Then her address. Louise sucked her cheeks together as if I was really now really inconveniencing her. She knelt by the bed where I sat and pulled out a box from underneath. She leafed through a green address book, then recited an address, which I wrote down on unfolded newspaper. I tucked in my purse. As she returned the box to its place under the bed, I saw a stack of books and gasped. Oh, those are Tommy's old books. We've been telling her to pick them up, Louise said. But I recognized the spine of the diary I had given to Rose at a as a farewell present. That's Rose. And uh, well, thank you Rose. very much. <laughs> and, and of course, uh, Rose was struck by a subway train at Clark and Division. And so the mystery becomes, was it an accident or was it uh, a suicide? And uh, so I, I realized that this is your device for get, getting your Aki into the, into the story as an amateur sleuth. Amateur sleuths are, are very big with you, aren't they? <laughs> they are, they are. And um, I think, well, I think that's why we like them. We mystery writers like our genre because um, there's something that happens that's um, so important to the, the main character that the main character is forced to move, to act. You know, they can't just be stuck in the, ch I mean, that's what happened with my first, some early drafts of Masarai because it was even before that was a mystery series. He was dealing with post-traumatic stress from being a Hiroshima survivor, but I, I couldn't get him off the bed you know, or off, you know, it's like there needs to be movement, you know, to get the story going. And um, 
Yeah, and I call it, I, it's just like been the right container for me. And I think some of that is, um, you know, be doing some crime stories for my former newspaper, I think. Um, and having the structure of uh, a crime novel is just, it's a, a good way to kind of introduce people to a world that either that they're very familiar with and but never see or maybe don't know at all. And this is a world we don't know because and I want to show you, I want you to show your PowerPoint here. Uh, this is a world we haven't seen before. And I think what people are responding to with uh, Clark and Division is uh, this, um, this, these pictures, and the, the, the picture you, you paint in the story uh, as Aki Ito um, navigates this new world of Japanese Americans who are, have been taken out of a concentration camp and sent to places like Chicago, Cleveland, or, or Detroit. So um, what are we looking at here? So um, before I describe it, Chicago was the number one destination for Japanese Americans who were released early from camp. And then, you know, after the uh, war ended as well. Um, before World War II, there were 400 Japanese Americans in Chicago. And by the mid forties, there were 20,000. So this is one of the families who um, had arrived, the Oshima family. And um, this photo was taken by the War Relocation Authority. And most of their photos are more celebratory of the Japanese American spirit and you know everybody's looking happy. And this is one of the rare fo photos of a family that really looks, dis you know, they just arrived at a hostel. And they they bewildered. Yeah, exactly. And just for those who are really into um, research, um, because all of those WRA photos are available online. But this one, we actually look, were considering using this photo for the nonfiction book I worked on, um, Life After Manzanar. Oh. Oh, and at the bottom, it says, all recently arrived from Manzanar Relocation center but then when we did research we found out they were from Tule Lake oh. so you know so luckily we caught in Oops. time but but just to and we used another photo but it would not be good to call it life after Manzanar no. when <laughs> and people in our community they're from Sacramento they'll know yeah. they, they would know yeah, yeah so. know. <laughs> but just just a little tip for researchers don't take the caption you know as gospel truth, like dig in a little more to make sure that they, they've been identified with the right name or location. But, but is, was that image just kind of a, a, an inspiration for you in, in, in deciding that this was the story you wanted to tell of resettlement? Um, it was more the documents um, uh. that, and there was one by the Chicago, and, and there was some uh, WRA reports that kind of described the chaos of Chicago that people weren't quite ready to, you know, there, there were a lot of jobs because at that time, Chicago was the number two um, city, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there was a lot of factories, there was a lot of defense work. So, um, so there was work, but in order, you know, like people had certain expectations because in camp, they would show these promotional videos that made them very excited. Okay, we're gonna get released if we're, you know, let go. And then, you know, we're gonna have this great life in this big city. And it didn't really, especially early on, it didn't happen um, the way they expected. And that was in the reports. And another yeah. thing, um, the Resettlers Committee report said that um, there was a lot of uh, delinquency because this is a family here, but the average age of the, there were all mostly Nisei who are being second generation Japanese Americans who are being released and they were in their mid twenties. And what do you do if you're in your mid twenties, you were in, you know, you were confined behind barbed wire with all these other Japanese Americans. Suddenly you're released into this notorious city with all these other young people, well, you know, you're gonna party and in some case there's gambling and some people are gonna get in trouble. So there was this report mentioned that babies were being born out of wedlock. There had been abortions, which, is, which was illegal at the time. There was a stick up man and there was a sex, sex maniac on the loose. So when I saw that, 
as a mystery writer, <laughs> I go, I have to write about Chicago, you yeah. know, <laughs> more so than even L.A., because in L.A., um, it was, you know, uh, more families that, you know, uh, yeah, 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 but these were people without parental. Yeah, I am going to show you a couple of photos. These were taken in Los Angeles, but this, like, I think captured more how I viewed the Japanese Americans, you know, who yes. faced the kind of resettle, resettlement or just the re being released from yes. camp. And just like, look at this expression on this little girl, you know. Oh. And this, uh, Marion Palfi was a European immigrant who, a photographer in New York City. And she did a lot of amazing, she was like a, 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 a photographer of like social movements and she's done some really amazing things. But this photo really got to me because if you've seen the WRA photos, like even that room, we well, they just had arrived, but this is chaos. This is like our pandemic rooms, right? There's everything is like cot, spread a, a out. Cot, yeah, in a hostel. Yeah, right. And then yeah. there's four families in one room was the title of this. Uh -huh. So I don't know how, and then all this clothing like that are just hanging, you know, and, and that little section I read, you know, the women, they were just, they didn't have a closet. So they're just hanging their clothes on, you know, on nails yeah, on the all wall. The possessions. Yeah. For, for our Seattle audience, uh, there's a similar scene at the Japanese language school here in Seattle at uh, Rainier and Weller. Uh, uh, a number of ret families returning from Minidoka, from Hunt, Idaho, uh, were allowed to stay in cots at the Japanese language school and became, it was dubbed uh, the Hunt Hotel. And family stayed there for months and even I think a year uh, in, in situations like this. So this is this is a very common scene of it, families it, re returning because their homes had been lost uh, during the war. Had you have you seen photos like that of Seattle? No, or you, you a, heard it described? There more. was an exhibit uh, <laughs> at, at the uh, language school. Um, yeah, and just this is probably the Rafu Shimpo newspaper, like because it restarted publication in 1946 and there's a bedpan on the floor and just look at the faces of these children. And so I think there was something about this image that sure. um, made me think, you know, it wasn't such a smooth transition. And even though I read a lot of oral histories, you know, I was kind of reading between the lines and, um, you know, and people, certain people are chosen to be interviewed. I mean, you, to be interviewed, you have to be willing, right? Yeah. And a lot of times you have some stature in the community. Um, so, you know, there were certain things like in the Chicago interviews that they alluded to, there had been a fight, you know, between there was some gang members, you know, but it was kind of downplayed. And when I saw that report, I was go going, I think there's more to this. And that's why I thought, you know, unfortunately, this gener the generation that would remember, they're pretty much gone, you right. know. Um, so that's, I think our time is now, you know, as fiction, uh, create as creative producers to kind of imagine, you know, taking the things that, that are out there and then filling in the blanks. I wanna say for our, our audience that all, all the things you described about the documents you found, uh, abortions and sex maniacs, Stick up, man. That, that's all in your book. You, you did successfully <laughs> capture all those details, and, and that drives the story. Yeah. And the, these are the zoot suitors, right? These are the zoot suitors. And I know when, uh, when I talk to Chicago folks, their uh, people, academics who've done some research in this, had a really hard time finding any photos in Chicago of, of the East LA zoot suitors who had encroached <laughs> in their town. But so this is a collection from a woman in LA. So most of the people in uh, Chicago eventually returned to the West Coast. So um, I think there's maybe some rich material in people's photo albums of Chicago, you know, more on this coast than, than in the Midwest, in Chicago, perhaps. Yeah. No yeah. But, but the, the, these pictures capture that sense of dislocation of, of, of a people who are kind of caught between two different places two different homes and, and they're, they're making their own uh, reality there in Chicago, the young men in zoot suits. And, yeah. and these are the, these are the men that Aki uh, meets in. in uh... Yes. Yes. Most definitely. Yeah. 
And yeah, and some of the histories that I had learned about them. And, and that's where the orphanage um, came in. Um, one of these individuals had been in the Manzanar oh, yeah. orphanage. So, you know, and that's dislocation again, right? So you, you were in an orphanage and then you're taken to, you know, orphanage and camp and then, you know, all these, yeah, you get into trouble and all sorts of things happen. Um, so what, okay, I'm from La Pasadena, California. I, you know, I work in Los Angeles. I've been in Wichita, Kansas, and I have been in Tokyo, but I've never really spent that much in Chicago. So once I determined I wanted to write about this place, which was in 2016, I knew I had to reach out to experts. And I know, Frank, you know, Eric Matsunaga too. Uh, Excellent tour guide. Yes. And then he has an IG account, Windy City Nikkei, and on this Discover Nikkei website, he has written actually about the real Clark and Division. And so he had this Google map and he took me um, around Clark and Division, which is really wonderful. This uh, building on the right hand side is the LaSalle. This was a former LaSalle mansion, apartment buildings where a lot of people were living in. And isn't and, the Clark and Division subway station where the, the scene of the crime, yes, as it yes, were? Yes, okay. yes, yes. So, um, yeah, and nothing really remains there. And there's no signage. There's, you know, it, basically Clark and Division for Japanese Americans was a way station. You know, it was just a temporary place. The ones who stayed in Chicago went into the suburbs. They went into other parts of Chicago. Um, uh, one building that did is still there is the Mark Twain Hotel, which I included in my book. Yes. Um, and because this is my probably, you know, I the Ralph Wushimpo newspaper is right next to Skid Row. Um, and so I'm, you know, not afraid to just like barge into places. And and Eric is much is m much more polite than I am. And he was saying, oh, yeah, this is there was a beauty parlor, you know, Japanese American beauty parlor in this hotel. And so I just, it's SRO housing now. So I just walked in and I don't think Eric had ever been inside. So he was just looking around and I started snapping photos. <laughs> but, uh, oh, and so th that particular hotel had applied for a national register of historic places. But I, I was kind of sad I mean, it's being recognized as a residential hotel of Chicago, but there was nothing that mentioned the presence of the Japanese Americans at one time. So I really think, you know, Chicago has yet to totally uh, document, um, acknowledge, or maybe, I mean, it's just so unknown because the government told Japanese Americans do not congregate in numbers, you know, three or more. Of course, they broke that rule, but they didn't establish a little, to you know, a little Tokyo officially. So um, yeah. there's nothing that really remains, right? right? That's why people like Eric are really important. And here I am. I know. Did you get the to Nisei Lounge? Is is uh, yeah. uh, uh, well known for their malort uh, al alcohol, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're deadly. Yeah. And it's near. Uh, uh, Near, near Wrigley Field. Wrigley like Field, two, yeah. Two, two blocks away from Wrigley yeah. Field. And it's a great, it's a dive. And it's a complete dive. And they, um, it's it's named after, uh, there was a Nisei Tavern, which I think they sold liquor and then, you know, maybe served it on the side. It mm -hmm. it, it has its roots in um, Clark and Division, but they, they moved uh, up to the Wrigleyville area. And then this, uh, another remnant, did you have a, Octagawa, did you eat this, Frank, no, when no, you were no. in Chicago? We just, we just drank. Ryan Yakota and I just drank. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Eric took me to eat this, which is kind of like a chop suey. There was a guy named George Octagawa who went to a, a place called Hamburger King and kept ordering so uh, this this concoction of food. And now, you know, uh, even though this eatery is not owned by Japanese Americans anymore, mm -hmm. they've kept up the tradition. Yeah. Just like Nisei Lounge has kept their name, yeah. Um, and then briefly, oh, Regenerations was the or history. There was an or history of this woman, Kei Kawahara, 
who had that beauty shop in the Mark Twain. And the, the beauty uh, shop's pivotal in the plot of, of Clark and Division. Yeah, of so I integrated that. I fictionalized, you know, the woman yeah. who operated that. But And then the Newberry Library, Sue Kunitomi Embry is very well known to- Now this blows Japanese my mind, Ailey, that when, it, I, when you said that Sue Embry was the inspiration, you know, brings us to this location of the Newberry Library. Uh, which is also where Aki works, uh, gets a job after, uh, in Chicago. That Sue Embry, the founder of the Man's in Our Pilgrimage, uh, you know, we knew her when she was middle aged. Here she is as, as a young young woman, uh, just starting out life in Chicago. And in her oral history, she um, really valued her time in Chicago, and it really exposed her to different ethnic groups. And um, right next to um, the Newberry Library is, uh, um, I think it's called Washington Square um, Park, where a lot of, it's called Bug House Square because people would be on soapboxes and talking politics. So I always wondered about Sue, like how she became politicized. So this is just my own theory. Unfortunately, she's not alive, so I could ask her, but I wonder if sometimes she would just stop at that park and like listen to these you know, people spouting out their political theories. And I'm wondering if any of that kind of touched her, but anyway, yeah. And then tropical, um, I also write about an area in Los Angeles and the it's in between Glendale and Los Angeles. And that just was a result of, that's where the family was from. I did an interview with someone, this is part of the 35 years. And someone said, I grew up in tropical. And then I'm thinking, where's tropical? And, you know, this interview might, might have taken place like 30 years ago, and it just stayed in my mind because I just, for some reason, I liked the name. And it was actually one of the first places that Japanese immigrants came to um, grow, you know, primarily, I think, strawberries. Um, back to Chicago, this is the Japanese mausoleum. Um, people... This is where you set the first meeting between Aki and her Somebody. <laughs> no, no spoiler. Her, her, her boyfriend, <laughs> yeah. a, a young man she fancies. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and this was a beautiful cemetery. Uh, Japanese could not be buried um, at other cemeteries during the war and in before. And so um, some first generation people, Issei, created this mausoleum. And it was also meant for the indigent poor people who couldn't you know, who needed a place to store their ashes. And um, th I think I only have a couple more slides, but this is the, this, uh, there's two Buddhist temples, established Buddhist temples in Chicago, and they both were formed um, after uh, World War II or during, I mean, in the 40s, 1940s. And um, I visited one of them, the Buddhist temple of Chicago. And in this back room, since they were having a festival, they had this altar in the back. And this was um, actually brought over from Heart Mountain. The uh -huh. um, Diome Kubose was a Buddhist uh, minister in Heart Mountain. So he brought this with him. And the other um, temple has a minister from another camp. So I thought that was kind of interesting too. If the relationships that people had with someone like a Buddhist minister, if that may have influenced, you know, where they ended up after, after camp. And I think I have two, only two more. This is just this uh, funeral. I, I have a Fred Klanner um, when, you know, th of course they don't have a Japanese, you know, mortician or whatever. So this is a, um, uh, uh, a, a funeral service that many Japanese Americans used, and it was in the Clark and Division area. And um, so that's a scene, and that comes early in the book too. It actually, Rose had, you know, um, the Ito family had a service for Rose here. I mean, talking as if they're real people. And this was a police building in the area, which um, this was taken, I think, in the 50s or 60, 50s. Um, but anyway, yeah, and um, that, of course, you know, if you're talking about crime, you have to talk about the police. So, so that's about so, it. <laughs> and so these are all the images that go into the, the kind of creation of the story that, that you brought us in, in Clark and Division? Yes, most, I mean, 
if I'm writing about it, I mean, I, you know, obviously you can just make up details, right? But I think for this kind of book, because there was, there hasn't been anything like, quite like it. Um, I, I think Nise Daughter, Monica Sonesh, you know, she writes about a, a similar kind of trajectory from camp to Chicago, but, you know, it, this is kind of showing the more sordid side of things. And I thought I had a responsibility to, to, to attempt to describe it mm -hmm. as faithfully as possible. And yes. then, you know, I, and then people can riff off of that and make things up in the future. But just for this particular time and place, I was going, I, I, I want to get it right. And that's why I have it set in a specific neighborhood at a specific time. I'm not an expert of Chicago. And I think there's going to be great books that are going to be set like in the 50s in Chicago, which is um, a more established community. And people are very nostalgic about that time period. But this is where, this is like the before times where people, you know, were unsure of, you know, what was going to happen to them. You mentioned Monica Sonia, of course, Nisei daughter takes, she, Monica takes a more cheerful look uh, on life uh, in Puyallup and Minidoka and Chicago. Uh, and yours, as you say, is much darker. But there's another author uh, who wrote a novel about post-war resettlement, uh, and it was set here in Seattle. Uh, and I think you know which novel I'm talking about, uh, uh, John Okada's Nono Boy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I wonder, did it ever occur to you that with, with No No Boy being the great novel about post-war Japanese America, maybe you're, you're risking, risking comparison to, uh, to the great Japanese American novel? Um, I didn't feel that way because I felt I was writing from a woman's perspective. Uh -huh. And I think that, would, um, that was going to add um, to the discussion because I think I love No No Boy, but I think it's very masculine you know, and there's things I really love about that. But I thought that, um, yeah, to tell, tell a story from a young Nisei woman's point of view would just um, widen, you know, right, a presentation. And, and again, also, because her relationship with her parents are different, you know, it's different than um, right. Ichiro is very angry, yeah. angry with his mother and, and Aki is devoted to, to her parents, protective yeah. of her parents. And I think both are legitimate, right? You know, yeah. it's, yeah. yeah, both responses are legitimate. So, uh, yeah. You know, I, you I, I, know, I noticed one resonance at the very, with the last line of Nono Boy and, and your novel, uh, you know, because Nono Boy ends with uh, Ichiro feeling a faint glimmer of hope at the very end. And there's a line with Aki. Do you know which one I, which one I mean? I, I, I know generally. Generally, but yeah, yeah. Generally, the last few pages, there's, there's a kind of a faint glimmer of hope moment for Aki as well. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if that was perhaps uh, uh, influence. Well, I think that what John Okada did was he um, was able to, and then he was an outsider, you know, also yes. to that experience. He was writing in, in Detroit. Uh, yeah, know, and, in, in, and also he was a, a veteran, you know, so he was writing about experience that he still cared about, but he did not personally inhabit in all, you know, in a very strict way. So I don't know what that means, Frank, you know, you're, you're more the scholar. <laughs> it was just a, an idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so we've uh, uh, we got to uh, go to questions now. And uh, Trudy Elliott has a question for you. Um, she asks, you know, were families given a choice of cities to live in after their release from the concentration camps? Do you want to um, answer <laughs> this, Frank? Do you have a personal knowledge? <laughs> oh, 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 well, I, I got to do I got to do this. So, I mean, I, I'm fascinated by the subject of post-war resettlement because I, I myself was a product of that program uh, that I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, you know, the, the five biggest centers of resettlement were Chicago, Denver, New York, Cleveland, and Detroit. And my father uh, getting out of Heart Mountain, uh, I think maybe, maybe true, this might answer your question, was that she, she was basically a WRA resettlement officer gave my father a job in an air conditioner factory in Cleveland. And so my father said, okay, I'll go to Cleveland, you know, out of Heart Mountain. I've, no, I've nowhere else to go. He was a young, young man without a family here. So uh, that was an opportunity for him. And I was born there. Uh, uh, 
I think I, I'm not sure if if families could request where they could go, or really if it was a matter of uh, Trudy where the opportunities were. Uh, say students needed to, needed to have a college that would accept them before they could be released from camp, and likewise they needed a job to go to uh, in order to bring their you know for a family to go be released. So. Uh, uh, they, they may have, they may have had, had some discretion, but mm. no real, they couldn't just say, I want to go to New York, uh, unless they had an opportunity. I, I think there were some um, networks, um, because I did a book on flower growers, and some of them knew of like, I think in Naperville, Illinois, you know, a big grower there. So some of them did, you know, and, and those folks had more connections. So they were probably you know, at least middle class, if not more, and, and that kind of, and then also some people, I, what I thought was interesting in, um, in Chicago on Clark and Division was there were certain hotels that were named after camp. Did you hear about this, Frank? Like there was a Gila River really? like apartment. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I do think- An Amachi, Amachi Laundry or something like that. Yeah. I yeah. I hadn't heard of that, <laughs> oh, <no>. but- <laughs> But I think the word kind of gets around. Oh, and then I did also notice that there were kind of what what's the the right word? Not like a recruiters, but almost there was like a, a guy in, who had resettled in Chicago who was writing in the Gila River newspaper, the camp newspaper about Chicago and the different opportunities. So, you know, so that may may have had an influence on people as well. Yeah, uh, Sharon Maeda says that her father ha said that they needed to have a job in a, a specific city to be released. And her father wrote uh, to his entire college class to see if any of them could help him find a job. And he ended up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I guess Sharon was born, <laughs> she says. So that, that's good to know. Uh, there's a question about your journalism background here, but I'm going to come first to, to Lori Matsukawa's question about uh, you mentioned the sordid side of Japanese American life in Chicago. Um, you know, why, Lori asks, why is it important to document the sordid side uh, of, that, uh, of that community? I think because it shows our humanity that, um, you know, and it, it, it is in direct response to the model minority myth. And I think that's probably, and Lori, I know you're a, a journalist as well, that our job is kind of to show the expanse of human life and and um, that includes crime, you know, and questionable ways that people, you know, treat each other or, you know. And so because this was such a big part of Chicago life, I mean, enough that this Nisei group was going to even call it out, you know, and even write the number of, you know, abortions or this or that. I just felt like, okay, you know, this, we need to tug at this more. And also, you know, I think there's this impression that we came out unscathed, from, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, and we, whoever's in a, you know, family that had, been, you know, had faced incarceration, you know, firsthand about the intergenerational kind of things. I mean, it doesn't happen with, it really depends on the people's, it, it's, I, I, I liken it to the pandemic. You know, you're gonna talk to some people that said, you know, the pandemic wasn't that bad. You know, I got close to my family, you know, all these things happened that were good. And then you talk to another family and who lost someone to COVID or, you know, mm -hmm. they lost their job. And, and both of those stories are true, right? And so I think that we need, like with the resettlement story, we need to see both sides or actually there's not only two, but the many sides. And that's what I try to also um, uh, reflect in Clark and Division because you have a lot of characters and they're all responding in, to their situation in different ways. So. Yeah, yeah, it, re it reveals a lot when you do that. We have an, an, a, diff a different kind of question from an anonymous person. She's interested, or here, interested in your crime reporting at the Rafu Shimpo, and um, uh, ask about your experiences at the Rafu in light of the recent attention to police brutality and corruption, et cetera, in the last year or so, uh, the racial uh, reckoning, awakening. Uh, looking back at the Rafu, 
Are there incidents you may remember from that time that have come to mind recently? Well, you know, I worked at the Ralph Schimpel in 1992. I was, gonna, was, I was wondering that. Yeah. Which was the, you know, the, the Los Angeles rebellion or yep. civil disobedience or riots, however you want to define it. Was it, it Rodney King? Yes. Yeah. And uh, we, our offices, like I said, is we're located not far from um, the Parker Center, which is no longer well, it's on its way to be dismantled, but, you know, we were very, we we're very close to City Hall. So when all of that stuff was happening, you know, our building, you know, I remember, um, I think it was a few days after um, everything was blowing up, and we were still going to work. And then we were the way our offices were at the time was there was a panel of glass and we could look out. We were on Los Angeles Street and we looked out and one guy, he literally took out a gun and just pointed it to another person on the street. And then our publisher said, everyone's going to go home. <laughs> and our paper was mostly mailed out and we there were curfews and we couldn't go to, um, yeah, to the um, main post office anyway. I mean, I think in terms of uh, that whole experience where you could, the stress and the tension in regarding race was palpable. Um, we were very close to, you know, these power, uh, centers of power, you know, whether it be the LAPD or City Hall and just kind of seeing how, you know, one place we did cover was, um, the Crenshaw area, you know, which is part of South Central. And um, there were a lot of um, Japanese Americans who were still living there. And, you know, some, some like uh, the gas station got partially torched and some were protected, you know. So we saw different responses to that. Good. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I just telling these stories, I'm not, I'm sure some of it, uh, when you go through something that's so like life changing, you know, you yeah. can't, I'm sure that enables us to have more empathy and understanding when that occurs to people, maybe even from the past. Yeah. All right, Karen, we're going to go uh, two more questions here, I think. Uh, we've got uh, Vince Schleitweiler, uh, but first, uh, David Moria, uh, who has handled a strong Asian lead, asks, uh, why was Chicago the place to go for so many? That's a hard city. Why did they stay there? And more importantly, how much of the crime in Clark and Division was based in reality and how much Naomi was fictionalized? The, the crime in Clark, it was, it, everything that was kind of criminal <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and, and not only the ones uh, committed by Japanese Americans, but, you know. Uh, others. All the others, yeah. Yes, others, we'll uh, just say others. Which, which is um, based on true, and actually some of the true incidents are even more, um, violent yeah. <laughs> than I described. Um, yeah, so in that sense, I, I, I don't think I could call it true crime because I don't write people's names in it, but yeah, it was, it was based in, um, on true incidents. And um, Chicago, again, you know, because there was jobs in Chicago. Right. Um, and I think that uh, unfortunately, because it's also a big labor town, they, the authorities didn't inform some of the labor unions that, hey, by the way, there's these thousands of Japanese Americans coming into town and they're going to get jobs, you know? So there was a little bit of tension. They eventually sorted out. But um, yeah, I oh. think, it, and it was in the middle of the country, the location, right? So, yeah. Very good. Uh, so I think the last question uh, for you, Naomi, we're coming to the end of our hour, is from our friend Vince Schleitweiler. Uh, as a Yonsei, oh, I'm sure he's from Chicago. I didn't know that. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm so grateful for this book. Um, it seems there are a lot of stories about resettlement mm -hmm. that are coming out now in Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, New York City, and elsewhere. Do you think, Naomi, there is a reason why it took so long uh, or to, to look at this period of history, post-war resettlement? Um, and why now? I, I think we were just so busy um, collecting the stories from the Nisei, you know, um, that's where our energy lie. And, and it, it should, should, you know, I think that was a good place. I mean, there's still, I think there are a few uh, Nisei, but I think now we're getting to the, the territory of maybe um, the older Sansei, 
who could speak in, and then what, what do you characterize yourself, Frank? What are you? <laughs> I, I'm very much like you. I'm, I'm a half Nisei because my father is, an, really, is really Issei. My father's yeah. born in Japan and my mother's a Kibe Nisei from San Jose, but she's functionally Japanese. So do you call yourself a, 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 a two and a half? I'm a but, yeah, generationally, yeah. You're, but we're a little but, but different. I'm very close, yeah. <laughs> I, I, feel, I'm, I feel different from my Sansei friends very much so because- Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just from that. So I, I, I think that some of it's just, you know, uh, that camp experience needed to be documented. And that's where our resources went. And, um, you know, and, and I think that that was important. But I mean, thank goodness, like J the Japanese American National Museum and JASC and some other groups, probably, you know, Seattle groups have done some, you know, some of those oral histories um, about the resettlement. But I, I don't think, even though they're out there, I don't think people have kind of looked at, studied them, you know, with, with any sort of focus. And, I, um, and that's why I think people are doing it now. And the thing that's interesting about resettlement is we're talking about places like Chicago, like Cleveland, like, you know, Detroit, that haven't really had this conversation or dialogue about, Japanese Americans that had been in their community. So I, I think it's going to be a rich and fertile time for that right now. Well, well put. I mean, I think the purpose of doing the oral histories was to leave a record so that artists like yourself could come along and, and develop, you know, creative works around their stories and, and keeping their stories alive and sharing them. Well, uh, I think we've come to the end of our hour. Uh, the, um, I was reading your entry, Naomi, in How to Write a Mystery Handbook from the Mystery <laughs> Writers of America. And you write in there that the, the amateur sleuth finds the writer and not the other way around. And Aki is an amateur sleuth. Uh, no other mystery genre reveals more about the author's inner work, inner life, work, or personal life. Um, so what does, my last question is, what does the, your protagonist, Aki Ito, reveal about Naomi Hirahara? Mm, you know, I think that we've kind of been in a parallel place, like in terms of, well, there's just the cultural side. And I alluded to that before, just being, feeling like a Nisei and feeling like during the pandemic, you know, feeling very protective about my, you know, mother, my father has since gone, but just, you know, wanting to keep her safe. You know, and I think also during the pandemic, there's been times I've had to take action where I don't want to, but there's like people around me who are in distress. So, um, yeah, so I think that there's the power of community. And, and um, I think I, I personally, during this period of time, have gained more discernment, um, yeah, to take action. And, and, and you did. And, and so does Aki in the book. Uh, congratulations, Naomi, uh, what people are just raving about Clark and Division. Uh, and uh, um, it's going to do, it's doing well, and will continue to do well. So uh, I want to thank you very much, Naomi Hirohara, for, for joining us uh, today. And I want to turn it back to uh, Kieran Maeda Allman. Hi. Um, so thank you so much and for such a wonderful program. And thanks to everyone who came here today um, to, to experience it with us. Um, I can't say, um, say enough about how wonderful I think that Naomi's book, um, Clark and Division is. Um, and I also wanted to point something out was that it was a comment that Eileen made earlier that I think really kind of gets to um, one of the reasons why I was so moved by this book. And Eileen writes, a maternal aunt graduated from Hunt High School and left for a Chicago business school. She would never talk about her time there. And after the family returned to Seattle, she came back too. This book provides some possibilities of her life. Right. Yeah. People had people was through some really tough times, and um, people don't always want to talk about them. And so, I'm hoping that your book will open up some opportunities for family conversations yeah. and community conversations as well. So, um, so thank you so much. Um, 
Naomi Hirahara. We have copies of Clark and Division at Elliott Bay, as well as copies of her other books as well, the Masa Rai stories and, and other books. And Frank Abe, of course, we have the Frank Okada book and we'll soon have um, We Hear by Refuse back in stock also. So thank you so much and hope to see you again soon. Take care. Thank you for having me. And I miss Seattle. Take, take care, everyone. Enjoy your <laughs> rain that you're supposed to get in two That's hours. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Write more books. Okay. We want to see Congratulations, them. Congratulations, Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.